Hi, everyone, and welcome to the SAG After Foundations, the business program. My name is Danielle Terciano. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm a senior editor for Metacritic. Um, before we're joined by our guests, I wanted to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks entirely to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given more than $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,500 performers. So if you're a SAG After artist and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information on that can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Bo and Emily Bridges of Acting the First Six Lessons. Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. How are you guys? Thank you guys for, for doing this. We have a lot of people here from both coasts, probably everywhere in between. So I'm very excited to, to jump in. They've gotten a chance to see your amazing documentary. Um, and it's really a pleasure to speak with you. And I want to, you know, talk a little bit first and foremost about the blend that you guys put into this project. It's not just a documentary. There's a lot of narrative storytelling as well. Feels like a really big undertaking. Um, tell me a little bit about what inspired you to adapt the book at all and specifically what inspired you to adapt it in that blend. Well, my dad gave me uh, the book that Boleslavsky wrote when I was 16 years old and probably gave it to my brother right around that same time and my sister. Uh, we gave it to all our kids. So it had kind of an impact on our family. And then when Emily was in college, why don't you take it from there? With, 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 sure. With, so, you know, my, as my dad says, he gave me the book, Bolsowski's book when I was uh, first in middle school. And, you know, it was one of those things where I don't think I really understood it the first time I read it, but then I kind of kept revisiting it throughout high school. And then when I was in college, uh, we studied the book in, uh, in an acting class. And my dad and I had always talked about you know, it's, it's written for those of you who are, we have many actors here. I'm sure you many of you have read the book and, and hopefully seen the film now. Um, but it's written as a dialogue. So it's written almost like a script format between the teacher and the student. And so we said, wouldn't it be interesting to see this as a story, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a play? And so that was uh, initially that summer I came home um, from college earlier that year at Christmas I had given my dad a word document I typed out Boleslavsky's entire book into a word document and I gave it to him for Christmas and I said well we're going to start working on it we're going to start just kind of editing back and and so that's really how it started and I was uh back in LA that summer, you know, doing Shakespeare up in Topanga Canyon at the Theatricum Botanicum and um, staying with my parents. And, and we started working on the book and, um, and we edited it back first. And then we kind of fleshed out scenes and we workshopped it at Theater West in LA. And so the, the play was published in 2011 by uh, Samuel French, now Concord Theatricals. And we performed it many times. Uh, A lot of different places. Different places yeah. early on when we were first working it out at libraries and community centers, whoever would really listen to us. And then, um, yeah. And then eventually, you know, once we we had the piece, um, we performed it at, at theaters all over. Um, and then you want to talk about how it became a film? Yeah, then uh, I had been invited to go to Ringling College to teach a, a master's class in directing. And I went there and my host for the uh, event, which lasted like a weekend, was David Shapiro, who has a, a mm -hmm. company, SEMCOR. Uh, out of New York. And I had a lot of fun during that time. And when it was over, you know, he, he had also, by the, by the way, had built all these incredible sound stages, state of the art, right on the campus. Dude. And we were one of the first people that used them and actually shot a film there. We used all of students in uh, a lot of the key positions. And so David Shapiro, uh, he asked me at the end of the of my time there, he said, uh, do you have any uh, projects that you'd like to make into a film? Because we, we want to make films here. And I said, well, yeah, matter of fact, and I gave him acting the first six lessons, which Emily and I had a script at that point. Mm -hmm. 
And he liked it, but he said, you know, this is such a great play, but uh, I'm really interested in the personal connection to your family. So it was David who came up with the idea of making a documentary aspect to it. And then uh, her brother, Casey, he, uh, he filmed it. He's a documentary filmmaker. So all the interview parts he directed and filmed. And um, yeah, so it, it kind of evolved that way. And then how I didn't know how it was going to go together. <laughs> that, that, that's her problem. <laughs> She's the director of my boss. Right. And she was able yeah. to figure it out, which I was happy for. It, well, it was it was a really wonderful thing because first, the you know, my dad mentioned the unique way that the film was made. There was a lot of life imitating art happening mm. here because we were working with these incredibly talented young filmmakers who were finishing out their academic careers, starting, you know, their new careers out in the world um right. did we know it at the time but at a pretty insane moment in our <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> planet's history um but so so there was that aspect to it and then with the documentary putting all of that together first of all you, uh, you saw in the film there was this archival footage yes. that was from my grandparents that was something that I came across years ago and knew that the interview existed, but I didn't know what the film was from. It was something that someone found at my grandparents' house when they were going through stuff after they had passed away. You know, it was that kind of thing. And so I did a little uh, sleuthing and discovered that it was from this film called From Russia to Hollywood by a filmmaker named Frederick Keeve. And uh, when I reached out to him and explained to him what we were doing with the project, he was very uh, generous and letting us use use the piece in our film. And it's wonderful because, you know, my grandmother's in there yeah. and she, you know, someone who's very important to me, obviously, but a lot of people have never met her before. And it's wonderful because you get their dynamic and everything. But what I what I was really hoping for people to experience mm-hmm. um, in, in terms of this sort of kaleidoscope of documentary and narrative is to feel like you're sitting with my family. We're all kind of telling the same story. Everybody's loud and talking over each other. You know, it's like you're at the dinner table. And so, so that was sort of the impression. And so between telling the story and intercutting the the documentary and then having this archival footage that was also shot in this very intimate way that seemed to work so well with the way that my brother Casey set up these very informal kinds of interviews with my aunt and uncle and my brother Jordan. Um, It just, I was very pleased with how those things all kind of came together, but it was a lot. It was, I didn't know where (laughs) we started. Right. I want to pick up on something you were just talking about in terms of, you know, the feeling like you're at a family dinner. Because everybody is in your family, working professional, busy, probably talking about acting a lot or when you guys do get together. So I'm curious how much time you really had to spend when you're setting up those documentary sections, those interview sections to get them comfortable talking about this. Or was it really just like, oh, we've got old stories. We can pull us out at the drop of a hat. That was the easy part. Well, I think one of the things I mentioned actually in, the, in one of those interviews, talking to my brother is remembering how my father told me when I looked like I was going to really try to be an actor, a professional actor. I was uh, like in my early 20s. And he said, you know, you're going to be joining a much bigger family now than you ever knew you had. I said, you know, you have a hopefully a strong family here, our, our family, but now you're in the family of actors. And I said, and you're going to be amazed what that means. You don't know right now. And now, you know, after doing it for, oh my gosh, 70 some years, I, you know, I see how much uh, we mean to each other because my dad also said, you don't do this alone, you know, this craft, you do it with somebody. And I mean, you know, I've, I've uh, been in there with people when we've risked our lives to tell the story. You know, it's crazy. It's it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful uh, group to belong to. I'm, I'm so happy that I, I do it. I love it. Yeah, and and in terms of 
the preparation for the interviews and, and getting people t- comfortable talking. I mean, as, as I'm sure, you know, it's, it's not hard to get an <laughs> a story, um, but no, I think, I think in a lot of ways, you know, our, we, we all know each other's good stories and it's kind of like the feeling where, you know, you bring a friend over for dinner and, you know, you have your, your aunt there, your uncle, and you know, that one story that always gets a laugh, you know, mm. you're going to try to go them into telling it. But um, <laughs> so there was a bit of a bit of that. Um, and obviously, my dad and I have talked about this stuff so much just from the, you know, more than a decade now we've, we've right. spent with this particular story. Um, I was very grateful to my brother, Jordan, coming in to play historian mm-hmm. and sort of dramaturg for us and guide us through for those unfamiliar mm-hmm. with Boleslavsky. Um, but yeah, it, it was a it was a pretty organic process, I'd say. Yeah. So we have a question from the audience from Susan, who says, great job directing. Have you ever felt intimidated being in a family of genius actors or has it fed you well? Oh, um I mean it's the only thing that I've ever known so it's hard to compare it with anything else um in terms of being from a a family of actors um it's something that I'm certainly grateful for I know that it is impossibly difficult to get that first job and um you know my experience the family that I was born into I grew up on film sets. Um, so it, I had a different experience in regards to that. Um, do I get waves of, you know, imposter syndrome and, and feeling intimidated? I mean, maybe, but I don't know how much of that is related to my family as it is just being an actor. <laughs> yeah, I think we all get that from time to time. Yeah. Just being in the world. Yeah. Just being in the world. Um, But actually to follow up on that, Lyndon has a question of how did you learn the craft of directing? And I'm going to amend that by saying, how much did you specifically maybe study your father's directing? Sure. So, I mean, this one was, I think it was a real gift in a lot of ways because we had, you know, for a first project directing to be something with characters that I've known for so long with an actor who I trust so deeply on so many different levels. Um, You know, it it was really a really, really big gift to have that as my first go, because I felt like um, a lot of it was, was relatively intuitive. And then, you know, might have my dad there, who's a wonderful director as well as an actor, but he really kind of stayed pretty hands off in terms of trying to guide my hand. Um, Mm -hmm. When he had something to say, it was worth listening to. Um, But, but no, it was kind of amazing. And, you know, as we talked about this sort of life imitating art with the mentorship Mm -hmm. happening on the set, um, because we were in there with all of these wonderful young filmmakers who are studying this stuff so deeply right now. And so I felt like, you know, I've been on professional film sets before, so maybe I'm giving them some of that experience, but they're teaching me a lot about the technical aspects of what we're doing. Oh, yeah, they were oh, wow. way, way ahead of us. On <laughs> and all the, all the equipment and, wow. and everything. Yeah. Um, so it was um, it was a really unique first one and yeah. it made me want to do it again for sure. Uh, for both of you, I mean, how did you feel like your relationship changed? You worked together before on other projects, but this is much more in depth and obviously much more personal. So, I mean, do you feel like your your working relationship changed at all just going through this process? Well, I think that, you know, we're both storytellers and we're a father and a daughter. And I think we recognize this real blessing that we had to be able to work together to tell this particular story mm. uh, which meant so much to our family and to our mom and dad. I mean, uh, it resonates all, all through our lives. Mm-hmm. It was a great experience. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed it all the way. I was mostly worried about learning my lines again, because I, there's so much, it's just those two people talking to yeah. me. <laughs> and so I asked for a teleprompter. Oh, wow, okay. And, you know, because I, I told my director, I said, you know, I don't know if I can do it. But in the end, 
I never used it. I, I knew he was never. Wow. Okay. Prompter. <laughs> I had it there, and it made me feel secure. Right. No, I think I think that um, you know when we first started messing around with this piece when I was fresh out of college, um, I feel like I would push a little more. I had a little more to prove, and and was you know would defend things a little. Mm. It, it, you know, um, and, and really, you know, feel the need to prove myself kind of. And, and I think that working together in the ways that we have, you know, have kind of developed our own little language. And with this, this last go of it, you know, I, I feel like I let the, the gratitude in a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's just, it's a really, I, I love working with my dad. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, just the time that it came uh, was uh, was so interesting. The timing of it in our in our lives. Um, uh, what was it about 10, 12 years ago or something like that? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I really loved about the whole story was that it was a relationship between a teacher and his student, mm-hmm. which is such a, a dear relationship for all of us. We all most of us have someone back in there, you know, our coach, our teacher, our parent was so important. Yeah. And then for us, um, I, the, we, like Emily said, we performed it at uh, Theater West in, uh, here in LA. And I've been a member of that place since I was in my twenties. You know, it's, I think it's the oldest community theater in Los Angeles. Mm. And so uh, we rehearsed it really hard and we opened it there. And the opening night, I get word uh, that uh, I'm diagnosed with a very aggressive cancer. Oh. And I'm sitting backstage with my daughter, you know, and uh, I'm thinking, do I tell her, do I say this to her? Because we have to go on and perform this. Right. Or do I wait? And I figured, no. You know, we're in this together. We're a team. So I, t- I told her there and we did a little prayer like we usually do before we perform. But it was, for me, a, such a personal moment. And I think something that all actors, all of us family of actors, we can connect to uh, because, you know, we are in touch with the human condition. We know what those things feel like. And so this this play it has so much meaning for me. I mean, I go through it, you know, that last thing when he's talking about rhythm and how she needs to, mm-hmm. really, you know, be attuned to all the different places. And, uh, you know, it's it's my daughter. Who, mm-hmm. You know, she's over there in a little oh, picture dear. of herself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, she, no, yeah. What I find really interesting about, about that is, the way you said, you know, actors need to be in tune with this. Actors are in tune with this. The best actors are. I'm curious if you feel like, and maybe this is almost an unfair question because you've re- you've had the book, but I feel like if you feel it, it, like you'd be a very different actor had you not been given that book. I'm cu- and I'm also curious about what made you connect to the book in the first place when because you, you could have been handed that book and said, nah, not for me. Hmm. Well, I would go further. I'd say I'd be a different person because, yes, it was a book about the craft of acting, which I knew my father was an actor, but I knew as I read it, and I read it more and more at times, it's about living life, you know, mm. living life, being, uh, like Emily says in the movie right at the beginning, learning to be present. That's what we want to be as actors. But that's what we want to be in our lives. And by the way, my uh, my cancer is in remission. So I'm <laughs> I wasn't sure if you wanted to share, so I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to put you on the spot. No, but that's no, great to no. hear. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm pretty yeah. good to go. I, I mean, another thing is, I think that many different, uh, you know, people have written a lot on similar themes to the things sure. that, that Boleslavsky writes about. So um, I'm certainly not a purist when it comes to acting, you know, I kind of think whatever, 
whatever gets you across the finish line uh, when it comes down to it. But I do think it's, um, it's handy. As my dad says, you know, he always says it's a, it's a small book. <laughs> it's a thin little book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but there's quite there's quite a bit in there. And, and, and it does. And I agree. I think I think I would also be a, a different person because it um, those things are, are both really connected. You know, there's a there's a guy I'd like to just throw out there for everybody too, uh, named Don Miguel Ruiz. I don't know how many people know of him, but he wrote his most well-known books are uh, The Four Agreements, and then he wrote The Fifth Agreement. He's kind of a shaman, doctor type yeah. of guy. He's really cool. And his one of his latest books is called The Actor, which he writes with his uh, uh, act, actor friend, a, a lady. And it's really remarkable. And he does kind of similar things in his book that, that Boleslavsky did because he talks, he uses us as actors when he's talking about life mm. to his readers because he says, we're all actors. We're all born actors. We're writing our own life story and we're the lead actors in our creation. Most of us make the same mistakes, which is to try to control our secondary character. <laughs> which, <laughs> usually refuse to be controlled right. when the only character we could really control is, is our, our person. Uh, I don't know how I got on that track, but anyway. no, yeah, it all tracks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to take a question from the audience. Um, there's a question from Barbara that says it was so lovely to see so much of your family in the film. Bo, since you and your brother both grew up with Six Lessons, how similar or different do you think your acting styles ended up being? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, I'll tell you, this is kind of interesting because that you asked that question because I've never had an assistant before on a job. I've always just gone in and done it myself. But Jeff said to me, he says, you know, you know, it's, it's good to have an assistant to help you. You know, you're getting older, you try it, you know, so... Uh, my last job, I got my godson, Nico Picaro, to be my assistant. Awesome. And he was fantastic. And I just, I just loved the experience. And I knew that my brother Jeff was going to, was going to work soon uh, with his old man series. So uh, I said, you know, if you want an assistant, I said, this guy, you can't beat him. He's fantastic. So Nico has now been Jeff's assistant. They're, he's work, they're working right now. And I had dinner with Nico the other night and with another couple, the other guy who's a jokester, he says to Nico, he says, so tell me, he says, who's the best actor? <laughs> Jeff or Bo? And he asked the same question that you just did. He said, what are, what are they like? Are they? And he said, well, it was really weird. He says, when I first went to work with Jeff, he seemed like so different, such mm. a different person and now he says as I'm getting to know them, they're very similar I don't know what, what that's worth but that that's what he Nico said I thought that was kind of interesting yeah I, I love uh, working with my brother when I get a yeah. chance to. it's really fun yeah I mean and it also I mean just I don't know if you consider the documentary part of this film working with them because oh, yeah, in definitely. a way you were interviewing them it's not the same as sharing a scene the way you guys shared scenes but I am curious if uh, that was there was anything on the, well, I'm curious, but also I will say somebody else put this in the chat. If there's anything on the cutting room floor from those moments, like fun anecdotes, oh, how, did you, how did you determine, because this is, again, as you were talking about earlier, like great family stories, you guys you know, have a million of them. How did I, you determine yeah. what to use? We are, you know, right, right now we're in my dad's office. I live about 20 minutes away. And so, um, there was, while well, there was a long stretch of the past two years where I wouldn't let my parents allow me in their house because I was trying to keep them in a bubble, you know, while oh, yeah. was so <laughs> scary. But, um, but during the, at least the beginning of editing the film together, I would be in here with my dad and I had, um, you know, cards that I had all the different things written out of moments from the interviews. And what I did was I went through and I marked everything from each interview, whatever they were talking about, which lesson it applied to. 
and uh, categories. yeah, categories. And then we kind of, you know, so we put all the memory of emotion together, put all the rhythm together, and then we start, you know, shuffling things around. And the thing that, um, that really surprised me most of all was how often, and I guess I, I shouldn't, cause we're, we're talking about how this book has impacted people. And this is like the way it has, but even when not specifically or explicitly referring to Bolosovsky's book, that the same language would come up to talk about, you know, I, th- I think this part ended up in the film, but you know, it's my uncle says something about a psychophysical gesture and then it comes in, my grandfather's talking about psychophysical gesture and it goes around kind of in this circle. And so there was a lot like that. And there was quite a bit of people telling the same story from different perspectives, um, which I just really enjoyed. Um, probably the majority of the the cutting room floor stuff that that I love um I love the interactions between my grandparents a lot of that ended up in the film but you know my grandma can go on a a (laughs) long-winded story (laughs) that you know I think the film probably would have been a half hour longer if I really (laughs) let her uh lead um but yeah, just lots of lots of fun yeah, stuff. Yeah. I mean, was that do you did you guys feel like that was a, a more emotional part of the film than maybe you were even expecting? Just like sitting sifting through that footage specifically, like the fact that you even had it is I think a rare gem. Yeah, I mean it was it was not particularly emotional. Um just because, you know, it's, it's, I think we were fortunate to have a lot of like, you know, photos and things that mm. people shot over the years that it's, it's amazing to find and to see, but it was, it was really special to be spending so much time, you know, when we're, when we were editing because those documentary portions at different points, you know, would be each little section was like an mm. hour long and trying to get it down. Um, and just, being around my family that much particularly also and then COVID did come and we were all so separate from each other Mm -hmm. but I was spending a heck of a lot of time with all their faces right (laughs) and that was that was kind of a nice thing yeah yeah all right well so I want to talk also about the scenes that you guys shared together where you're performing together because that's also a lot of time a lot of one-on-one time with each other Um, And there's a really interesting piece of it where the student is talking about the struggle of film versus stage where you're not linear on on film. And and so I'm curious how you guys shot those pieces. How much of them did you treat like the play and just we're going to do it multiple cameras straight through in order? Um, Well, I I think it's interesting you talk about the the scene where she's complaining about, um, you know, the jump to doing, doing things on film. I think it's real, again, life imitating art. That was the first scene that we shot using the green screen and we were doing a long walk and talk, right. Which you can't really do if you're using a green screen. So there was a lot of walking Mm -hmm. and then walking back and then walking and changing our angle and walking, you know, and, and it was difficult to, um, it was challenging to orient ourselves, you know, where is the lake? Where is the, you know, and it was before we knew what anything was going to look like with the VFX put in, you know, which is sort of this like slightly otherworldly kind of heightened reality place. Um, So you've done more of that kind of stuff than I have. So I was kind of new to it as well. Yeah. Yeah, Dante did such a great. Yeah. uh, Dante Rinaldi was our uh, VFX producer. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I think his putting us up on the Empire State Building at the end, that was incredible. I mean, you know, because we had a very limited budget. Yeah. That was really the only way we could ever do yeah. that. No, but there there were certain, um, you know, with uh, some of it happened in, in the editing as well, um, you know, with the scene where they're rehearsing and she's frustrated. I ended up keeping that really tight um, because it felt like I wanted it to feel like, you know, that feeling when you've been rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and everybody's sweaty and the lights are still <laughs> on and everybody wants to go home. And, you know, so it was, some of it was done in the planning. Some of it was done in the editing, you know? Yeah. It was, it, it kind of informed 
the the play I think informed a lot what the cinematic choices right. were. Like one one example is in the play we would always come out and we introduced ourselves as ourselves and mm-hmm. we kind of gave a little back, bit of background about the book, the book and, and yeah. our family. And then we would say, okay, we're, we're going to perform a play now. And then we'd go away and we'd come back and yeah, perform the, the play. Yeah. And then at the end, we ended every performance we've ever done of the, the play, the even readings or whatever we, we do a Q and a after, um, because you know, the it's, it's such kind of heady mm-hmm. stuff that it really needs this sort of dialogue to sort of digest it and going into making it into a, a film that was the per that, that was served by the, the documentary portion right. or that, that was the, the desire. I think a real important contribution to the film too, is uh, our friend, Maestro Arturo Sandoval, who did mm. the, the music. It's it's really beautiful. And I think it helped make those transitions, you know, between mm-hmm. the play and, and, and the and the and documentary, the documentary. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. without yeah. even knowing it, kind of, you know, very subtle, very pretty. Yeah. 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 And that was done all um completely remotely. I was gonna say it had to be, right? Because you guys were just yeah. Yeah. COVID for two years. <laughs> all the editing remote too. Yeah. Yeah. But no, but the but yeah, the music uh was a huge that that was a part where in the editing process really feeling like, oh my goodness, look at this. It's a movie. I <laughs> know the final yeah. touch. Um so Lilia has a, a follow-up question to what we were just talking about about the the jump. Um, She says, I related so much to Emily's character getting flustered and feeling like a puppet and having trouble with the scenes being chopped up or even getting the chance for only a couple of takes. Just wondering if you two have had any advice from your own experiences in that regard. Well, I've had had so many different ways. I mean, Clint Eastwood is famous for Clint and and I've worked with him. So I know what they're talking about. You get one shot, one, one take. You know, so everyone comes in loaded for bear. You better get it, you know, as good as you can. And then he moves on. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he still does that. That was a long time ago that I, I did that. And then, uh, you know, my brother, he likes, you know, he'll do many, many takes, lots of takes. And so it, it's different with each uh, each person. But it, it especially if you're used to the theater, and you're, and you're coming into film, it can be kind of challenging at first. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, something that I sometimes do if I'm feeling that pressure is I try to, you know, all the things that we do, you know, kind of center yourself, don't forget to breathe, you know, right. all of that. but also I'll tell myself in my head, if I, if I really screw it up, I can always ask for another take. Hmm. And usually because I tell myself that I don't need to, because, you know, nine times out of 10, it's just us getting our little like editor going in our brains. And, um, but for some reason, that's something that helps me. And then if I really, really do need it, I I think I may have asked for it once or twice. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds a lot, listen, I'm not an actor, so it sounds to me like a lot of, the importance of these lessons boils down to like staying ready. Like a lot of the, the way that you're seeing the world, the way that you're learning to cue up these different emotions, like something that stuck with me was that, that scene where she, where you're talking, Emily, about um, she's uh, the students almost gets hit by a car because she was just like in this other world, thinking about this other emotion, making herself believe it was real. And I'm curious how you guys feel about staying in that level versus turning it off when they call cut or turning it off when you go home? Like, how do you kind of balance? I think that the creature in that moment that you're talking about is at, you know, I, I coach actors as well. And, um, and it's actually, it's a really, I think, delicious uh, space to be in when you're working with an actor who hasn't, you know, who's is starting their sort of journey with this stuff where, the emotions are there, right? Like they're, they're starting to connect. They're starting to feel things like they're real and they're happening for the first time. Um, And to sometimes people need to know that they have permission to go and, you know, have dinner and, 
be home with their family and not let yourself be consumed by whatever you're doing at work because you can't stay there. If you stay there, yeah. you'll, you know, it's, it's harder to have the energy to do the work that you're going to do. I mean, that's my take on it. You know, I, I think there's probably as many takes on that as there are actors, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you, this is a question from Norma. Did you guys make any new discoveries when you were performing this uh, that you hadn't noticed before? The words in this, uh, in this book are quite incredible. And when you get to actually speak them and think about them, uh, they had a, rem a remarkable effect on me. And I really took a lot of it to heart. You know, that last speech that he says to her, talking about, um, you know, the importance of, of observing everything and, and feeling everything, you know, and the importance of love and, and creation. All great stuff. Stuff that, you know, my parents talked about, my dad talked a mm -hmm. lot about respect uh, for yourself, for the people you work with, for your craft. You know, a lot of people that don't know about acting or don't know actors, you know, they they watch TV or films and they think it's it's kind of all about entertainment and making, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't know what people go through to, to put this out. And also for us actors to remember uh, how ancient our our craft is, the craft of storytelling goes back, you know, since the dawn of man. It's important to tell the stories. So uh, it's important to, to respect what I think what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emily, were there any discoveries for you? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I say that I discover something new every time we perform this. Um, I think that the film sort of captures one version of of the ways that we've we've done this show you know um and and I like that uh you know I think that particularly when you're trying to tie everything together in terms of how we're going to present this to other people mm -hmm. that was probably the most daunting thing for me because you know if I'm looking at three different takes of my my dad and he does something great three different ways and I have to pick okay what do we want to have in this mm -hmm. moment that, you know, once we pick that, that's, that's it, you know? Um, so, so it was fun putting this together because we've done it so many times and um, in doing it so many times, we've done it so many different ways and it kind of feels different every time we perform it. You know, I joke that, that anti-character sometimes gets a little possessed and, and <laughs> she gets a little bit wilder or she's more, you know, subdued and intense and, um, different lessons become, you know, that kind of float to the, the top in terms of the most profound moment for, mm. for their relationship, you know? Um, and, and I think that that's that, you know, that is heeding Boloslavsky's words is that, you know, you're not thinking about what you want it to look like. You're thinking about what's happening, you know, in the moment. Right. What am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Dennis has a question. Um, he said, I appreciated the film. I also felt a spiritual undertone to it and how acting is connected to the realm of spirituality. The mention of being present and listening reminded me of Eckhart Tolle. Was that intended? The, yes. the spirituality yes. aspect. Okay. Cause yes. we've been talking a lot about being present. So I don't know how much, you know, I don't know how much you want to get into religion, but um, just no, no, how think, intentional yeah, the, the spirit. I, I think uh, it's, uh, you know, we talk about that in, in, in the movie. Uh, the spiritual aspect of it, yeah. because in the end, like my brother talks about getting away, getting out of the way of the mm -hmm. process and giving it up you know, spiritually, letting being a vessel, you know, and that's when it gets the best. Doesn't always happen, but. Yeah, no, and, and I would say that, um, you know, our, our fa family members, everyone who appears in the film, I think certainly expresses their their faith their spirituality what as it is in in different ways but um for for me sure faith is is quite part of the process mm -hmm. when you were speaking a second ago about uh 
getting out of the way, sometimes being the vessel. I'm curious if there's, if there have been moments in, in both of your careers where you felt that happening, like you were in, not on this project maybe, but you're on a different set and you feel like I, I'm in my own way and, and what you needed to go through and, and how you were able to get out of your own way and how much of that is maybe referring back to some of these lessons. Yeah, I can, I can recall one, one experience. I was working on Norma Ray. Marty Ritt was the, dir- the director, wonderful director. God bless it. And uh, and I had two scenes uh, for, for the day. And my part was a good part in the play, but not one of the leading roles. That was Sally and Ron Liebman. And I had this scene with Ron Liebman where uh, he uh, is sort of the other man in the relationship. And he's, you know, uh, and he's, I suspect that he's, you know, seeing my wife and stuff. And he comes in the room. And so I prepared my butt off for this scene. I worked on it so hard. And uh, it was beautifully written, I thought. And then I had later in the day, I had a little scene with Sally where I only had one or two lines. So I didn't really think about that one. Did this scene. And after I did the first couple of takes, Marty Ritt comes up to me and he says, Bo, he says, Stop acting, he says. The Ravages, that's a wonderful husband and wife writing team. I, I don't know if they won an Academy Award for Norma Ray, but I think they were nominated. He said, they wrote an incredible script. Great words for you to speak. All you have to do is just say the words. So, you know, I, you know, I was probably kind of a young guy at that time. I was in my 30s and I... I took it bad. I I tried to just say the words in that scene, but I felt defeated. I felt that I'd let the team down. All my preparation, you know, didn't work. And then I go in and do this little scene with Sally where I have like one or two lines. I think I say to her, I sit down on the bed and I say, you know, know, no matter what happens, I'll always be here with you. And it's just everything, all the emotion and stuff that I thought about before hit me. And it was because I think, probably not consciously, but I had in a way given it up just because mm. I just wanted to yeah. you know, get the scene done. I was sitting there and looking at my friend and the emotion got to me. So getting out of the way, yeah, sometimes yeah. a good thing. Yeah. It, I mean, maybe this is similar, but when you're talking about staying present, there, there's this piece of, the, of your uh, documentary that, that you were talking about the Evian being sprayed. And I kept thinking like, I don't know how I would be present in that moment in a character. Like it's very easy to be present and react to something like that. How often do you have to actively think about working through distractions, like in order to stay present as a character versus just present in the moment? I just remembered something that that just flashed on for the first time. Yeah. In the movie, my brother talks about uh, Being you, squirted with Evian, yeah, with Evian, and 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 making it something that changes him into a magical it's a potion. creature, yeah, yeah. A makes potion. him hungover. Potion. And I was like shocked. I was like, I never would have thought about that. And Emily gets sprayed. Gets sprayed. I, that's the first time I really looked oh. at that connection. That's it pretty... was on purpose. No, no, <laughs> it was. It wasn't. No, it did. That was good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I guess I'm just yeah. wondering if, so, so if there is like an active, actively working through distractions as yeah. a character so that you're staying present yeah. as the character versus. So this is actually a good bit. You talk about cutting room floor stuff. I mm-hmm. remember Jeff um, talking about um, distractions on set and how um, it can be challenging if you know you're getting ready to do a scene and all of a sudden you know someone's getting a tour of the sound stage and then they're bringing in the lunch and you know and all these things are happening and you can kind of let it take you out of there right mm-hmm. if you're in that headspace 
or the other option is to baptize it in to go. Okay. That's part of the, everyone bringing you know, in lunch. That is part of what is happening in this, you know, <laughs> kitchen sink drama situation we're having. There are also those guys back there and that is fine. That is part of my reality, you know? Um, so, so there's that approach connected, I think would be using it. You know, you hear that a lot. I think about um, in that scene where I was so uh, flustered, um, you know, with uh, walking through the park and storming around and thinking that was kind of a challenging day technically. Yeah. And um, while things were, you know, go, going smoothly as they can when things are, are are challenging. You know, I think I kind of brought some of that in and, you know, used it. So you can either be distracted by it or you can use it. Um, yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. I mean, it doesn't sound easy, but it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to, you know, connecting to this material in the, in the beginning and, and saying, I want to make this something. I want to make this a play. I want to make this eventually a film. What did you think your challenges were going to be at the starting point? And how did they maybe evolve as you actually were working from medium to medium? Well, uh, when we worked it up at uh, Theater West, we, it took us about two or three months and uh, our director was uh, Charlie Mount, who he, he contributed so much. I mean, we, he, you know, utilized a lot of his wisdom that he brought to the piece, uh, even in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and how would you describe kind of what our process there when we were working? You mean like early on, I think the challenges were mostly just getting it written and getting it, you know, we didn't want to mess with, the words too much mm. because what Boleslavsky had written is so beautiful um, and poetic. Mm. Um, but we needed the characters to come off the page a little bit. So there was a few places where we wrote in scenes, some of which don't even make it into the film. Actually, there's little additional bits in, in the play. Um, you know, you see the creature out auditioning, mm. you know, things like that. A mm-hmm. um, couple, couple more characters for, my dad you had to move it along because there's a yeah. lot of talk in it mm. yeah so we talked we spoke a lot that was about a challenge pacing the importance of pacing it mm-hmm. and keeping it moving for sure um and then once it came to the film aspect um it was a little bit of that again because we had to cut a lot of the play in order to make it condensed enough that we could also bring in the documentary mm-hmm. uh footage um so so some of it was just logistics you know kind of plugging things in here and there um one thing i discovered early on was that these two characters the teacher and his student the creature are at important times in their life i think you know the creature may be more obvious she's young actress she wants to you know get her career going but i thought the teacher was probably at a, a real down spiral in his mm. career and ready to kind of give up teaching, tired of it. And so this relationship that happens, which happens in father-daughter relationships too, is the teacher begins to uh, kind of, you know, find more uh, more uh, enjoyment in his life through his student. His student is really teaching him and it kind of reverses. And I, I really like that. And I, we tried, we talked a lot about that. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, it was interesting for me to reflect on too, that the first time we did this piece, I was, you know, very much at the same place in life as the creature at the beginning of the piece. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now 12 years have gone by, I sort of identify more with, with later creature, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. And when you were um, talking about not wanting to change the words too much, did you have to do anything to get the rights? Like, how did you handle it? Was in, uh, it was in uh, the public domain. Okay. Um, so we were able to adapt it. And then we did the copyright on the play and the film. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, that, that was fortunately book, something we were able to navigate. The book is that. used in so many uh, 
acting colleges and universities. Mm-hmm. I feel like they're going to use the film now. I mean, right? Like oh, nobody no. who wants to yeah. read. Nobody wants to read. We don't want to watch a movie. Yeah. So yeah. here we go. Um, and you were just talking about, you know, the the extra pieces, the audition scenes and, and things like that that didn't make it in. How many of those were actually filmed and maybe you could make it online as like a bonus feature? Sure. No, we um, we actually everything that we filmed made it in the movie. Um, wow. Almost everything. No, there was maybe one. Hmm. One little quick scene that did. Oh, see, as a scene. Yeah. Not, not yeah. The film, the film, Betsy, there were a lot of stuff that you edited. But yeah, no. We're talking about the scene. Yeah, we're talking about the scene. <laughs> um, we we kind of made that um, choice writing the script. Some of the things don't translate as well, I think, to, to the screen. You know, for example, that Ophelia scene is she does the whole scene by herself, mm. just the monologue. And, um, that didn't really feel right. You know, it, okay. uh, it's a different kind of medium. And um, yeah, so there's things like that. Yeah. I mean, I kind of said it as a joke a second ago about like they using this in acting school, but like in all seriousness, is that something you guys would pursue? Like giving this to whoever, you know, <laughs> USC, UCLA, whatever programs and saying, here's a tool, you know, it's, it's entertainment obviously, but it's also very educational. Actually, um, at the end of, of this movie, David Shapiro, uh, our exec, wanted us to, uh, Casey, my son, to shoot mm. me giving a uh, an acting class, mm. a master's class there after one of the shows, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we did that. So we have that. So we may use that somehow. We haven't really decided. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but I hope I hope that people watch this film in in their classes because I think that it's certainly great and it's you know it's a it's a very specific sort of thing <laughs> for people to be interested in. So if they're into it, I hope they watch it. Yeah. All right. Well, before I let you guys go, um, I have one last question from the audience, mm-hmm. and it is, I think, a thinker. So take a second with it. Um, it's from Didier. If you could add a seventh lesson, what would it be? Ooh. Oh, by the way, there are supposed to be. Oh. Uh, there's supposed to be other lessons. Right. Oh, yeah. He wrote, he wrote more. Wrote more. That's true. But so if it doesn't you have to be your yeah. own personal lesson. It could be one of the other ones that you're choosing to. Yeah. What would. I want to share oh, this, dear. this little thing here before I go. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is <laughs> from Emily to me. And I'm sure a lot of dads out there. Oh, that's cute. And this is International Women's Day, I think. Yes, yes it is. Yes. Oh, so that's here's, nice. Here's my girl writing to me. She's how old are you here? And about four or five. Uh, yeah. She says, my dad. My daddy sometimes play my little pony with me. Sometimes he takes me to his work. He works in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> he takes me on the big swing. He likes cucumbers and pickles and wine. He likes to kiss me and hug me. He watches baseball on TV. <laughs> Emily. That is very funny. <laughs> Come a long way. You know that, by the way, what she was talking about, Dallas, Texas, she was in that movie. It, it's called uh, Daddy's Dying, Who's Got the Will? Uh that was yeah. my first one. Del yeah. Shore is her first movie. So I was three. She yeah. was three. Oh, okay. And she was dressed in a little red tutu and opened the movie singing uh, Precious Memories. <laughs> uh, that's funny, Dan. I think seventh lesson uh, would probably be, my dad mentioned it, something that he got from his dad, something that he shared very much with um, all of us kids is, is respect that at the end of the day, you have to have respect for yourself, for the other people who are involved in the thing you are making. Uh, Cause rarely do we, 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 I don't think we would ever create in a vacuum, you know, um, someone is experiencing the thing you're making. Someone is making it with you. You're making it somewhere. Um, and then there is the thing in self that you're making. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think the seventh lesson might be respect. Yeah. Uh, and I would say, 
joy is very important. Mm -hmm. Bring the joy because we all have ups and downs in our lives that we bring to the workplace. And so you need to bring joy. My, uh, my dad was my teacher, uh, important part of our film, gave me acting the first six lessons. The other big guru in my life was my basketball coach at UCLA, John Wooden, mm. created a thing called the Pyramid of Success. He created it as an English teacher, just all the blocks of the yeah, pyramid. That, that's up here too somewhere. Yeah, the, the, all, all the blocks of the pyramid that lead you to success. Mm -hmm. And for coach, success had nothing to do with winning. It had to do with leaving the task knowing that you've done your very best. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pyramid, or the two cornerstones of the pyramid are industriousness, hard work, and enthusiasm, joy. Because Coach said anybody can bring hard work mm. to the practice field, but if you bring it with joy in combination with joy, that's when special things happen. And then the very apex, the very top of the pyramid, uh, when it's game time, is divided in half. Faith and patience. Mm. He said because... You know, you don't have to tell anybody that once you get going on the task, it never happens the way you think it's right. going to happen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, I really like those principles. Yeah. No, that's excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing and for being here. Um, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, obviously, we want to thank you for sharing your experiences and your craft with your fellow performers. I want to thank everybody who is watching from all corners of the world right now. We love that we can do these virtually because we touch so many people. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much, everybody. I wanted to say one thing to you. Sure. Someone else is, was watching this show right oh. now. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That's my dad painted yeah. by my brother, Jeff. That's <laughs> really good. <laughs> that is really good. <laughs> yeah. All that's right. great. Good well, thank you guys, you guys so much. Peace, everyone. Peace.